Hello and welcome back to iProperty Radio and Property Matters on Dublin South FM with myself, Carol Tallon. You can contact us on social media at iProperty Radio or email hello at iPropertyRadio.com. I'm excited about our next guest, uh, Karen Douglas, who is the co-owner of DMG Architectural Practice. But there's a lot more happening there as well. Karen, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Carol. Great to be on. Um, so, Karen, full disclosure, I, I think I mentioned before we started recording that I follow you on Instagram, so I'm already a fan, but I'm really interested in your approach as somebody who is not good at visualizing, not strong at design. You know, I, I've used immersive technologies to help me visualize design and concepts in the past, but you're you're doing some really interesting things there in Waterford. So you might just give us a little bit of background as to how you got involved in DNG architect the architectural practice and how that led maybe to your new your new venture. Great. So I would have worked as a coach in industry. I would have had a HR background. I would have done a lot of startups over the years. And then I would have specialized on executive coaching. And I decided I took my own advice and I decided I think it might be time for a bit of a sector change. And um, I came into architecture and myself and Ronan McGee actually set up a practice called DMG Architects. I was in the practice maybe about two or three years and I started noticing lots of trends from customers coming into the business and feeling very disconnected and the architect having to do lots of different revisions, not through their own fault, but not asking enough questions and the client maybe goes home and has a week to look at the drawings and then it sparks something else. So in tandem to that, I went back to do a Lean Masters in WIT, which looks at efficiency and productivity and the process of flow. So I know that flow is so important spatially for particularly in residential. Everybody says, oh, the flow is not working. Something's not right. So my job in the practice is to design processes that allow the customer to flow from the start all the way through and for the architect to enjoy it. So I'm always looking at the value. Where is the value for the customer? Where is the value for the architect? How do we take out the waste? I was that person. I built a home about 20 years ago, my very first self-built. I was quite young doing it. I was green. I was clueless. I trusted an architect. It turned out to not be what I thought. I ended up having to sell the house because it went so over budget. It went the variations. It was, I couldn't spatially visualize it. And I went on to have children and all the bedrooms were on the ground floor and there was a master suite upstairs, which was completely not how we were going to live. So I suppose the serendipitous nature, is that what we call it, of coming back into architecture for me, I sort of spare the war wounds a little bit of knowing when you don't are not at the table enough and you aren't heard enough and understood. Um, and also it's quite strategic, you know, it's design, it's strategy. So for me in the practice, I started spotting, you know, the customer really struggling if the architect would ask a lot of questions. But the other thing is that part of my thesis found that the action research study I did showed that actually the customer, the architect isn't behaviorally trained. So they're trained in a studio with nobody, lovely, quiet, warm studio. There are no customers. It's a fictitious budget. And then you're launched out into a family with dynamics or couples or life, death, births, marriages, all those things. So for me, the behavioral side, which is a lot of what you do in Lean, where you're coaching and there's a lot of psychology. So the behavioral aspect uh, led me to set up the design lab, which is a spin off of DMG. And um, Karen, I'd never heard somebody talk this way about um, approaching architecture. But the interesting thing, it is something, it, you know, this is how we've learned to talk about, say, um, for house hunters, uh, anybody working with home buyers, the consumers, because it absolutely comes back to the behavior. And, and you're you're so right when you talk about kind of architects not being trained on the behavioral dynamics, because that absolutely changed that from the theoretical projects. It's the same in the practice of law. It's the same in the practice of yes. uh, many professions, I would imagine. Yeah. But yeah. those dynamics are what what derail projects. So that's a really interesting one. You So you mentioned you actually went back to study this. And yes. so uh, your thesis you have now turned into a book. So you might just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. 
So for me, I like to kind of know why I do what we do. So the thesis started off as an action research. So I sampled in live time with architects and clients. And I saw a gap in terms of good architecture is about problem solving first and then solutions afterwards. And I found that I think through no fault of their own, the architect is trained to sketch. So their first instinct is to sketch, but they're looking down at the customer. So the book was designed to allow the architect to stay with the training they have but maybe not be part of that very, very, very early initial stage with the customer. So if you're sitting at home and you're doing renovation or a new build and you're thinking, where do we start? And the architect says, oh, you need to think about how many rooms you want or all the different things. The book allows you to go at your own pace and it's also interactive so you can watch videos. So it explains things like, you know, citing public private space, you know, the flow in your space, how you can actually think about that yourself. And so it's done across chapters and you each chapter allows you to understand more, even designing your, your own interior space. You know, art is a huge factor in this. So helping you to understand what your art style is so that you can come to the architect and say, I love pop art or I love art deco. And the architect then is trained you know, to understand, well, these are the shapes and patterns and motifs. So it takes out a lot of the sort of waste of drawing. You get more good value time with your architect. Um, again, you know, as I mentioned at the start, I'm somebody who is not good at design, not, not good at not even capable of visualizing things. So actually the, the idea of an interactive design journal, I think will take away a lot of the fear because um, design can be very overwhelming. I think you know, obviously it is something that can be learned, but I think that there are definitely people that have a more innate tendency uh, towards being able to do this. So actually having the tools. Um, but I, I suppose one of the things I was really interested in when I saw the work that you're doing, because I love how you're approaching, um, how you're approaching architecture, <laughs> almost with our architecture being the least important part of it, which I, sounds bad, but I, but um, yeah. Yeah, I, understand. I think it's a really interesting approach and it's it's so innovative, um, but you've really taken the innovation a step further. So, I, you know, I mentioned that you have a lot going on and certainly kind of we want to, to make it so that um, a, a lot of what you're saying is about giving ownership to the yes. to pe the people who will be living in this home. So, that, yes. you know, it's not just about being the project owner, it's about actually taking ownership of the choices and understanding the choices that you're making and how they're going to impact on how you want to live. So exactly. tell me, where does the design lab fit in in that? Because R&D is a huge part of the innovation we're seeing around the built environment. Yeah. Um, but we don't often hear about that maybe at a very uh, consumer level. So yeah. you might just kind of talk us through the design lab offering. Sure. So the design lab, so the first thing always in, in, in people would say is, coming into a, an architectural practice can be very daunting. So they're very nervous and they're quite sheepish and they come in with their magazines and they feel they, they don't know who to be or how they have to be. So straight away, I wanted to create a curb appeal so that people can see it's, it's right on the street. You can look in, you can see people working, you know, and then it allows them to come in. So what we do is they can come in and they can book a session. They can say, look, we're thinking of going on this journey. And for me, I suppose, again, putting on the lean, you know, that, that value hat is where, what problems are you having? Because I think people look at design and they think they don't realize that there's a problem they're trying to solve. So how many times have you brought the washing basket upstairs and downstairs? Actually, now we're thinking, can we put a laundry upstairs? You know, if you don't hang out your clothes, but if you don't ask those questions, so people think they're very stupid questions, but they're actually hugely important because they affect how we live every day. And I always say that, you know, I'm a mother with teenagers. So for me, I've built and renovated. And for me, the most important things are how the house is going to flow. So the customer comes in and it isn't always the architect that they meet very first because we're trying to understand how they see, you know, how you will look at something and how I will look at something would be very different. So maybe your visual style might be a model. Mine is maybe the plan or maybe mine is a 3D or maybe it's a sketch. Lots of customers love the sketch because it's very fluid. And I think it's such a shame because architecture schools are, are, are slowly doing away with more of the sketch and going all 3D. But some of our clients, so it's to help them understand what do I need to see? How am I seeing it? You know, am I crazy to go on this journey? But most importantly, Carolyn, you hit upon it is 
they are human beings. So it's human centered design. Lots of families have a loved one with neurodiversity and it's not something you will share openly to somebody. And it's not an open question. If you're not trained behaviorally, you're not going to say, do we have neurodiversity in the family? So it's being able to pick up on, and we do a lot of coaching with the architects in our practice, how to spot that without making somebody feel vulnerable. And we get a lot of customers, um, I'd be very open about, I have a neurodiverse in our family. So for us, it's knowing those touch points of what they need and making it part of the conversation rather than it being a room on its own so that it's inclusive. Um, so it's very much a safe space where they can explore and play. And we get clients who are sketching, they sit opposite the arc and they love it. Um, so it's a really nice uh, environment to, 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 to design. Um, you know, you talk about kind of the human centric design, but obviously, you know, humans for as much as we change a lot stays the same. Um, but we know that COVID has been so transformative, uh, particularly it, it's really uh, I, I, I don't know. Have we changed or have we just become more intolerant to the things in our home that that don't work because now we probably never spend so much time in our homes so what kind of shifts or trends are you seeing you know perhaps as a result of, of yeah. COVID but perhaps ones that would have happened anyway I think there's positive and negatives that we're seeing I think the positives are you're right people are re-evaluating the value in their home and people never looked at it as, as, as a system and it does it functions as a system so people are saying you know, I was in lockdown, I did so much housework, I never, I'm sick of it. So they start to notice the quality of the materials that they're using, you know, you know, if, if it's a cheaper material, are you going to be cleaning it more? They suddenly want to get their lives back and they don't want to be all day a slave to the house. So you have on that side of things. On the other side, they're then noticing how many times I've gone up and down the stairs, the noise, the amount of customers that come to us and say, oh, my God, the noise, the TV. I never noticed it before COVID in this open plan. I want to go back to cellular rooms. And then on the negative side, we're seeing people, the homes are becoming almost like a fortress where everything is in there. So they're not leaving the home, which you know, good architecture is about community. It's about getting people back out. So, you know, I think architects have a challenge in terms of balancing the need for society to communities to remain, which is part of designing a house, and then also helping them really understand the value of how they need to live and not being a slave to the house. And that's where efficiency and all of those things come in. You know, they, one of the really interesting things there is around noise because actually noise is coming up. I, I truly think, you know, we, we're starting into our fifth year of broadcast now and up until COVID, I don't think we ever discussed noise in, in the context of the built environment. And now it is so huge. So actually only, only I'd say in the last two or three months, I did a really interesting interview with uh, Paul MacDonald, who is the managing director of Solitus Systems. And he talked about uh, soundscapes and how silence actually isn't the answer. It really is around yeah. soundscapes. And, and exactly. you know, he he explored this new concept of psychoacoustics and how artificial intelligence is helping design professionals to do this. So actually, if you haven't heard, I'd recommend you listen because it's genuinely, it was so interesting. But the big thing was um, tolerances seems to have been the biggest thing that's changed during COVID. It's not that things got more or less noisy. It's that we yeah. became more or, or less tolerant. Um, so that's that's a really interesting thing to think about in your own home and in that space. Um, Karen, I, I genuinely love the approach that you're taking. Um, you know, I, I think that this could really revolutionize architecture and how, how it is, how, how it is engaged with by the project owners, by the people who are going to be living in the homes. And um, I, I think that this is a really empowering way to approach yes. the design of your own home or the redesign or the retrofit or whatever it's likely to be. So um, just you might just remind people of your book and when it will be available. So the, the design journal is called Coming Home and it's available online at the moment at the design-lab.ie. Um, we're hoping that it's going to be in bookstores in the next month or two as well. We're hoping to get it on the shelf, which is really exciting. Um, obviously, we have the design lab on Instagram as well, um, where you can follow uh, a lot of chat and a lot of good stuff there around the whole thought process around design. Um, yeah, so very exciting times. 
Um, Karen, I will touch base in a couple of months again, you know, when we've started to see consumers using that interactive journal and, and figuring out how that's benefiting them. Um, again, I, I, I mentioned to you that I am currently uh, embarking on such a project, so I will certainly be using it, using it myself and I look forward to it. It's definitely something that I need, so that's great. great. Um, thank you so much. That was Karen Douglas of the Design Lab. We need to take a quick break. Stay tuned.